The philosophy behind microkernels is that you want to keep the kernel as small and simple as possible. There are very good reasons for this. It's much harder to write kernel code. That kernel code can be much more dangerous if there's any bugs in it. We want to make it as small as possible. So instead of doing what Linux does, which is this monolithic operating system where all the stuff runs at kernel mode, we've got our file system that's running with kernel privileges. We've got all our device drivers running with kernel privileges. All of this code, millions of lines of code in a Linux system, is running as supervisor. What we want to do with a microkernel is try to make the code that runs at kernel mode as small as possible and move things like device drivers and file systems into user mode. So amount of code that we need to worry about having access to all the machine resources is much smaller. That's just the small microkernel. So this seems well motivated. It's going to be safer, easier to reason about, easier to write the code, the smaller the kernel is. What is the minimum functionality we have to provide in that minimal kernel? Can we get rid of it completely? OK, good. Yeah, so if we want to have the abstraction of a process, the kernel needs to at least provide control that gives us memory isolation. So the kernel is at least going to be able to do things like control paging. So the things that control whether or not a process can read some memory, well, that has to be in the kernel. So that means, at a minimum, the kernel has to be able to do things like create a process and transfer control to that process. Are there other things that really need to be in the kernel? OK, good. So why do we think we can't do the scheduler up here? Is there a reason the scheduler has to run at kernel mode rather than user mode? Good, yeah. So there's some question. What makes the scheduler happen is some interrupt comes in. If that interrupt goes to a user level program, first of all, something got it there. So unless we change something really fundamental about the OS, when an interrupt comes in, this microkernel has to deal with it and send it somewhere. If it is up to a user level program to decide who gets to use the CPU, well, that user program can take over control of the whole machine. Right? So if we're saying that the minimum thing an OS has to provide is the process abstraction, that implies that the scheduler has to be part of this minimal kernel, because if it's not, then any one process can take over the whole machine. If we assume that something, anything has to do to be considered an OS is provide a process abstraction, at least parts of the scheduler has to be in the minimal kernel. We're going to need something there. It doesn't have to be all the things that are in the Linux kernel. These are some of the emails that I showed you the one back in class three. So this is the one that instigated it, was Andy Tannenbaum sending this mail that Linux is obsolete. His excuse for Minix not working is that his real job is a professor, so professors can't be expected to build working things. But his other answer to this is this explanation of the question of whether you want a microkernel or a monolithic operating system. His claim is that these old OSs are monolithic, and his definition of this is exactly the same as ours, although maybe a, a li even a little stronger, saying it's basically one program that runs in kernel mode. So that's a monolithic OS. All this code is running in kernel mode. It's not just Linux that's a monolithic OS. It goes back to all the early OSs, as well as even things like MS-DOS. All of these had huge programs. The whole OS was running in kernel mode. And this alternative is the microkernel-based system, where most of the OS runs as a separate process. So this gets into this question of, what does it mean to say it's the OS if it's not part of the kernel? Often, we've informally been saying what the OS means is the kernel. Once you start saying, well, there's an OS that runs outside the kernel, then you're getting more into the marketing or consumer notion of an OS. That when people talk about their phone running Android, they're not talking so much about the kernel as all the GUI-facing things that are mostly outside the kernel. This gets into a fuzzy definition of what an OS is now. All these things outside the kernel, well, they're providing the abstractions, they're providing the services that programs rely on. So they're still part of the OS, and they were you know, part of Minix or part of any of these microkernel OSs that he identifies. That means it's the kernel's job to just do the things that are really necessary. We identified some of those on the last slide. These are all the things that are basically needed to provide the process abstraction and allow programs on top of that. So the ones we didn't get to on the last slide, the interrupt handling, 
sort of mentioned that. You need somewhere that the interrupt goes, and something needs to get it to the right place, and that seems like the kernel should do that unless you make it go directly to, to user process. You need the low-level process management, things that allow you to set up this virtual memory abstraction. He's a little on the fence as far as the file system saying, you know, maybe the I.O., some of the I.O. can be part of the kernel. And there are lots of systems around, this, this was 19, 1992 he was writing it, that are designed this way. And part of the reason thinking the future was going to be all microkernel based was Windows NT was being thought of as a microkernel system. We'll talk more about that soon. And so his claim is that, you know, it's pretty clear from all this, microkernels are better and they've won. That was a little over 20 years ago today. So how many of you are actually running a microkernel OS? You're actually almost all wrong. Almost all of you are actually running a microkernel OS. It's just not the one that you think you're running. We'll keep you in suspense on that a little while longer. Which one actually won is still a pretty good question. But it certainly looks like microkernels did not win. No one thinks they're running a microkernel OS, even people taking an OS class. That the OSs whose name you've heard of, like Android, like Mac OS X, like, um, I won't mention Windows because that's a slightly tricky one. Most of those OSs people think of as monolithic kernels. So why did microkernels not actually appear to win or not actually seem to have won this if it seems clear that they were a better idea back in 1992? Are there any drawbacks to this microkernel design? Okay, good. So. Which one's actually harder or easier to implement is a good question. In some ways, it might be that the microkernel is harder. We argue that, yeah, it is definitely harder to write a file system in kernel level than at user mode, but it might be harder to get a whole OS to work in the way you want if you've got to deal with all these separate components rather than have this monolithic structure. So certainly many people would agree with you on that. Is there any other reason? Okay, so is it just message passing that you have to do or, or things more expensive than message passing? Because it depends what you mean by message passing. What's the really expensive thing? If you have this kind of design and you're implementing your file system here, in order to do something like create a new file, what are you going to have to do? Yeah. Yeah. So you might have to switch, right? So this is a really expensive transition. Transitioning between processes is also expensive. In this model, if you want to create a file, you call F open, you're doing one system call. There's one context switch. The kernel implements F open, does all the interactions at kernel level. There's no other context switches. And then when it's done, you go back. If you're trying to do this with the microkernel design, how does your application get into the file system? It's got to make a call to say, I want to create a file. How does that enter the file system? Can it get into that process directly? What you would like to have happen is your application goes to the file system once, it has to go to the kernel of the hardware. That's the ideal path. So maybe you're adding one extra expensive message passing event or switching between processes. What do you really have to do? Do you just have to switch once or twice to create a file if you are putting your file system as a separate user level process? So what are the steps to create a file? And now we'll think about, about not the in-memory file system that you implement for problem set four but like the Unix system 5 file system that we talked about or the Zeta file system that we talked about in class. What are all the things you have to do to create a file? So the first thing the application has to do, right, it's going to do some system call, something like fopen, that the application does. How does that get to the file system? How did it get to the file system in the monolithic kernel? What were the steps when you did an fopen call in your Zeta server? How did it get to the file system in the monolithic kernel that you were running on top of? Yeah, right. So you need to switch into the kernel, right? And you do that by doing an interrupt. This is a system call. So you're doing an interrupt in your application. That's the only way you get across this boundary. You're doing an interrupt. That's going to the hardware, which is going through the kernel, getting this, this is call handler, going to the file system. That's going through the drivers, eventually going to the hardware, doing some stuff, and getting back to you. So that's all the stuff that's happening when your program does a system call that's going to interact with the file system. A lot of stuff is happening, but there's only one really expensive thing is the context. Well, there's expensive things with the disk, but there's also this really expensive thing of the context switch. But you only have to do it once. Well, once there and once back. You switch once into the kernel, and then you do a context switch back to the user program when you're done. In this microkernel design, how many context switches do you think you need? Do you need just one in and one out? Yeah, 
you're going to need a whole bunch. First of all, you can't go from just the application to the file system. For these processes to talk to each other, they got to go through the kernel. They got to go from the application to the kernel to the file system. Now, the file system probably needs to do some things that touch the actual hardware. To do that, it's got to go to the device driver. So it's got to go to the kernel, to the device driver, to the device driver, going to go to the hardware. That's going to do another contact switch to the kernel back to the file system. Maybe the file system has to go back to the hardware. Through the right. So it's going through these contact switches lots and lots of times. You'd have to analyze it pretty carefully to count how many. But it's not just one or two. It's probably close to a dozen contact switches. So that's really expensive. So what's expensive in a microkernel is that we have to do all this inter-process communication, which, at least with the way traditional kernels are designed, is very expensive. This is why it seems like, well, maybe there's a good reason that microkernels did not win. Seems like it's going to be a lot more expensive to implement all the things that we want our operating system to do if we move those things outside the kernel, because we need all these extra contact switches. There was a lot of debate about this. So Andy Tenenbaum claimed that the performance, and they had benchmarks where they showed the performance of Minix being within a few percent or maybe 5 to 10 percent of the performance of Linux. So Minix is the microkernel system, and Linux is this monolithic kernel. They look pretty close. So are we convinced? So why is this not convincing? OK, so it could be a question of, yeah, that, that's definitely one good thing to look at. Are we measuring the thing we care about? If we care about latency and we're looking at throughput, it might be the case that throughput is actually better, but the latency is a lot worse, and that's what really matters. In this case, I think if, if I had the results for latency and I don't, they would have also been pretty similar, maybe even as close as these or maybe even closer. But that's, that's one good, good point. So we got to look at, are we looking at the metric that we should be? What's the other question we should ask about the benchmark that we're using? The other real question is, is the workload, right? So we looked at, are we measuring the right thing? Is this a workload that actually measures what matters? And if we're talking about comparing two operating system kernels, well, the workload should be what programs are doing. Right? That's what we're trying to understand is, how does this impact the performance of programs? The workload that this is showing is, a program that does random reads on the disk of various sizes. Is that a good program to compare the overhead of different operating system designs? What's the main thing that, that impacts both your latency and throughput if what you're measuring is a program that does random reads? Exactly, right? So this is just measuring how long it takes to do a disk seek, especially the fact that they're random. Maybe you could, if you're comparing file system designs that try to put files in good places, then maybe this could be a good benchmark for that. But it's certainly not a good benchmark for kernel design. What it's really measuring is disk seek time. And since it's dominated by that, any little differences between the kernel implementation are very insignificant. What you want is benchmarks that model other things programs do where they're dominated by the kernel time. And when you try those kinds of benchmarks, you find that Minix is really slow. For things that matter, like creating a process, Here's Linux, here's Minix, and here high numbers are better. These are sort of normalized based on some way of measuring performance. So it's not clear what the absolute numbers there mean. But many of these things, Linux is much faster. That supports the notion that at least between these two designs, there seem to be big performance advantages for the monolithic kernel. And when you look at the cost of context switching, that's understandable why that is. I hinted at this a little earlier. Did microkernels really lose? So this debate was in the early 90s. Andy Tannenbaum saying microkernels have won. It looks like the kernels most of us think we're using are actually monolithic kernels. One of the OSs mentioned in that email was Windows NT, which is not that fashionable, but still has quite a few users. It passed a billion several years before Android did, and it's still used. So if Windows was a microkernel, and descendants of Windows NT, like Windows 8, that is um, mostly descended from Windows NT, then maybe there are actually a lot of people running, running microkernels today. Is Windows NT and its successors really a microkernel? How would we actually decide this? If we want to answer yes or no if some operating system is a microkernel, what should we do? Can you figure that out by just running it? Not really easily. Right? You could maybe get some guesses by timing things, but you don't really know. There's no way to really tell without looking at how the operating system is designed. The design of Windows NT came from this operating system called Mach that was developed at Carnegie Mellon University in the, the mid-80s to, to early 90s. The leader of the project was Rick Rashid, 
who ended up becoming the director of Microsoft Research. This was the design of Mach, at least from the 1986 version. The original Mach had a design like this. So it had a kernel layer that did virtual memory management, inter-process communication, did some device drivers, and did scheduling. And then it had, at a higher level, some things like a file system. This is arguably not quite a microkernel. Right? There's more stuff in the kernel than really needs to be there. In particular, having some of these device drivers in the kernel is something that a true microkernel would argue against. But it's pretty close to a microkernel. And that was Mach 1. By 1992, they had was Mach 3, which is more what was the basis of NT. And that had a much smaller kernel layer. And then service is above this, but these run at user mode. So this was definitely a microkernel system. They certainly labeled it as such. And it was designed to be a very small kernel and move as much as possible at to user level. So that was the basis of Windows NT. So that's certainly why it was legitimate for Tenenbaum in 1992 to think Windows NT was going to be a microkernel. The actual design of Windows NT looks more like this. So it still has an attempt to be a microkernel. There are things that might be part of some kernels that have been moved into user mode. But it's got a lot more in the kernel, like at least if this is to scale. The kernel's pretty big to be a microkernel. So there are things, including drivers, including things like IO managers and all these services that make the kernel really big. So I think it's probably fair to say that Windows NT is not a microkernel. It's sometimes characterized as a hybrid, that it's not a completely monolithic kernel, because there are parts of it that are outside running in user mode, but the actual part that's running in kernel mode is much too big to claim to be a microkernel. Maybe it's still the case that no one is running a microkernel today. So how many operating systems do you actually have on your Android phone or iPhone? How many processors do you have? Good, yeah. So the, the chip that's doing the communication, right, that's communicating with the cell towers, that's actually a separate chipset. Almost all of them co come from Qualcomm. And that's running its own operating system. It has much less functionality than the main processor. But it's a real processor, and it's got a real operating system. And what the vast majority of those are running is L4 microkernel. So this is a microkernel, and it makes pretty good sense. Well, it is a less capable processor, doesn't need to do as much. So maybe that's why it's running L4. There are far more than a billion systems running it, because it's not just running on Android. Almost all the phone manufacturers are running either L4 or something similar to it on their radio chipset. So the, the biggest one is the Snapdragon chipset that Qualcomm sells that is running L4 on that, this microkernel, which actually is mostly developed by a little Australian university. That's on many billions of devices. Now, performance certainly matters there. If they had this problem that we talked about that was making Minix so slow, then that is not what Qualcomm would choose to run on their chipsets that are in all the mobile phones. 